Hello, valued viewers. I hope you're all doing very well. Just a gentle reminder that the Super Thanks button is on. It is located on the taskbar near the Like button. Simply contribute $20 or more toward the channel's effort and get a video of your choice topic done as the next available project. Simply make the contribution and go to the comment section to describe your topic that you would like to have done, and I do it just as soon as I possibly can. Now on to the video. Good day, kind people. This video is about uh, what makes a steam locomotive able to drag uh, 10,000 tons uh, on a straightaway or up an incline or in things like that. So I decided to do a video and describe to you each of the factors that allow a steam locomotive to be successful in pulling all this tonnage. So things like such as uh, drawbar horsepower, uh, tractive effort, etc. But I didn't want to be overly techy with it though, on the same hands because it gets confusing. It's hard to follow that. That way so i decided to name each element uh that makes the difference in success or not success uh in uh, pulling all this tonnage for a locomotive so and also while well, on the same hand keeping it simple so hopefully i've done that for you all and i hope you enjoy this video so with that uh, take a seat buckle up and enjoy the ride In the age of steam, estimating the horsepower potential of a locomotive was a common thing to practice. The Baldwin Locomotive Works even developed a widely used technique of finding these horsepower values. The Pennsylvania Railroad's William Kessel expanded on Baldwin's formula, and between the two, that became the final measuring stick, if you will. Boiler horsepower is estimated by the elements such as pressure, temperature after superheating, evaporative heating surface areas, and the type of feed water heating equipment. The boiler is absolutely the biggest mover on a steam locomotive. Boiler horsepower is the maximum horsepower that the locomotive is capable of producing. Once boiler horsepower has been identified, the drawbar horsepower can be ascertained at any speed. The drawbar horsepower is the horsepower produced at the tender's coupler. This is what moves the train. Like with any automobile or even a tractor, it takes energy to move a locomotive in its consist. This energy usage can be substantial and reduces the power available from the boiler. To get the value of drawbar horsepower, you first have to find the estimated value of this energy usage. The factors in finding its values are 1. It losses due to the locomotive's mechanical and rolling friction, or just friction for short and two, windage value, which increases with speed, so that is the wind resistance. So when the boiler horsepower uh, reduction is applied with the factors mentioned, the drawbar horsepower can be calculated at any speed, as I mentioned before. A quick antidote about the Chesapeake and Ohio Allegheny locomotive. It measured a whopping 7,500 drawbar horsepower, which I believe is still second among any locomotive ever built. However, on the Chesapeake and Ohio, that kind of drawbar horsepower wasn't entirely necessary because the railroad limited any consist to 160 cars, which was roughly averaging out at 11,000 tons. And another thing about that kind of drawbar horsepower was the fact that there were some uh, Chesapeake and Ohio engineers that were fearful that anything over 160 cars on a consist and the Allegheny's drawbar horsepower would start breaking couplers at the tender. Now, I never read any stories of that any kind of mechanical mishap like that ever happening. It was just a basic fear among some of the engineers there that that sort of thing might happen with the Allegheny. Okay, so moving right along. Generally, tractive effort is put into three categories. The three categories are applied under different operating conditions, but are related by common mechanical environments, such as torque on the driving wheels, diameter of the driving wheels, and friction. The first tractive effort category is starting tractive effort, which is the force that is generated from a standstill. This is critical to know because it determines the maximum weight a given locomotive can get into motion. The next category is maximum tractive effort. This is simply the most tractive force the locomotive can generate without causing any sort of damage. Maximum tractive effort is produced at low speed. And the third category is continuous tractive effort. And this is tractive effort that can be maintained unlimited. In order to get a steam locomotive started and, ac and accelerate, the locomotive must produce enough tractive force to defeat the consist resistance. And that is caused by axle bearing friction. 
or friction caused by all the wheels on the rails. Gravity, if the train is starting on a grade, and once in motion, windage produces even more drag. The train will eventually reach a speed of which the available tractive force of the locomotive will exactly offset the total amount of drag causing the acceleration to stop, and the train is then, has then reached its maximum speed. For any steam locomotive, the ratio of the weight on the drivers divided by the tractive effort is called factor of adhesion. A factor of adhesion of four or better is a good balance of pulling force and weight on the drivers. If the factor of adhesion is too low, say at 3.7, the drivers would be prone for slipping on startup and or low speed drags. So when I'm doing individual locomotive uh, specifications and I get to the factor of adhesion, you, you all have heard me say frequently that it's a robust of 4.15. And given the definition of factor of adhesion in this video, that's exactly what I'm referring to when I make a comment like that in any given video. Now this one, I don't believe I've ever seen in any um, in publications regarding tractive effort or anything like that, but I felt like it, it deserved or needed to be in this video because it does in fact have a uh, impact on tractive effort, and that is speaking of uh, low pressure cylinders. Now this applies to some classes of articulated uh, locomotives only, and in the uh, compound melee, such as the early uh, class of 2882 Chesapeake's, Low pressure cylinders use uh, the steam that has already been expanded in the high pressure cylinders, and that essentially uh, uses the same steam at work twice. This method produced better fuel efficiency and a higher tractive effort at low speeds and or startup. In simplistic terms, how this worked was that the steam exhaust from the high pressure cylinders fed into the larger size diameter low pressure cylinders via a receiver and finally, the exhaust uh, winds up going out the stack. And the key benefits of this system was efficiency of uh, steam use, and that in turn lowered fuel consumption. And also, it increases the torque and the tractive effort, and especially at startup and low speeds. And finally, at great, it was great at preventing slipping. If the driver slipped, high-pressure steam fed faster to the low-pressure cylinders, resulted in a rapid increase of power in helping the locomotive regain the traction that it was losing. So as you see, uh, low pressure cylinders should in fact be discussed in this particular video topic. And with that, this will conclude the video and I hope you enjoyed uh, watching the video and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.